Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being with us um, virtually. Uh, this is our um, Guiding Parents and Guardians um, series. And this um, today's topic is about, is it the disability behaviors or both? Um, the panelists today are myself, Lanny davis Frecker. I'm president of Julie Billiard Schools. Um, we have Dr. Jay Burke, who is a presenter tonight. We have Tyler Bond, who is our BCBA at our Lynnhurst campus, um, who is also a presenter tonight. We have Mrs. Jody Johnston, who is our Director of Academics and Teacher Development. And then we have Mary Jo O'Neill from Hickman and Louder. Um, we really created this to support our families and support them in relevant topics. Um, so tonight's discussion is really about that fine line between, you know, holding the children accountable, but recognizing their, their struggles and kind of how do we navigate that together. So tonight what we'll cover is this um, from an academic perspective, where to push, when to pull back, um, social perspective. Um, and then there will also be a Q&A with all of us to be able to ask questions. If you think of things, feel free to put it in the Q&A box at the bottom. And then Jody Johnston is going to lead, lead us in the Q&A uh, towards the end of our presentation. So without further ado, I will kick it off with Tyler, our BCBA at our Lynnhurst campus. Thank you so much. All right, so um, when we kind of talk about behaviors, um, you know, we're looking at it from, you know, kind of like typical behaviors of kind of what's happening, um, but then like, how is it related to the disability and are the behaviors because of the disability or, um, you know, just because they're kind of occurring. So some of the areas that we see in the school setting um, specifically are the, like the disrespect, aggression, kind of communication, um, then also kind of that academic homework piece of it. Um, so looking at the, the disrespect, um, you know, there's kind of a lot that goes into that. As the students um, kind of get older, you know, we see that happen a little bit more, um, you know, which is, again, somewhat typical because they're learning to kind of exert their independence, kind of like testing limits, testing boundaries, kind of seeing, you know, what they can do, where the boundaries are, um, you know, so we do expect some of that, um, you know, when it becomes a kind of an issue is um, with a lot of these is really kind of when it starts to affect like the academic performance or kind of social relationships with, um, with the students or their peers. Um, moving on to um, aggression or, you know, kind of property destruction type behaviors, um, you know, is it, is it a tantrum? Is it targeted? Is it because um, of their disabilities because they can't regulate themselves? Is it, um, you know, they just don't want to do it. So they're just going to throw their stuff on the floor. Um, and it's again, kind of a gray area, um, but looking at, um, you know, what what is happening so um you know uh um physical aggression it could be um because they have kind of work refusal or you know it could be because of their disability they just can't regulate themselves and that's their impulsive reaction um but we got to kind of step back and kind of look at it in the classroom setting um is it you know, happening all of the time, or is it just one specific student that they're targeting to hit um, or, you know, have aggression towards? So, um, you know, we can kind of narrow that down a little bit more kind of based on observations and kind of looking at some of the data from the classroom observations. Um, but, you know, we can't say that it's because of their disability if they're only really targeting one specific student, because um, we would typically see that across peers kind of across settings um, and not just with that one person. Um, moving on to um, communication, we know for a lot of our kiddos with um, autism, this is kind of one of the, the deficit areas or, you know, kind of one of the greatest areas of need. So what we see in kind of the academic setting is um, not responding the, the best way, right? So 
um, you know, you're kind of maybe in a in a conversation, like two adults are having a conversation, and it's kind of walk up in between and just start talking. Um, you know, not a necessarily problem behavior, but again, um, they don't have that kind of awareness of um perspective taking that there's a conversation going on. So with that is something we can definitely teach. Like that is, you know, part of the disability, part of um where they can grow. So, you know, we can kind of teach that, um, you know, when we're teaching that and we kind of see that it continues to happen and there's opportunities for them to independently kind of work on that skill and it's not necessarily happening. That's when we would probably, you know, take a step back and look at it a little bit more closely to see, all right, like, is this, you know, kind of interfering more? Are they able to kind of get this skill um, and kind of see how we can target that a little bit more? Um, moving on to homework and kind of homework refusal, if you will. Um, you know, we hear from parents a lot that, um, you know, we couldn't do their homework last night because, you know, they have ADHD, they just can't focus, they can't do it. Um, you know, it's an attention thing, like they can't, they can't do it. Um, which, you know, we definitely know that if they have ADHD, it's going to be hard to kind of, um, you know, really sit there and focus. So, um, while that's true, it also is we kind of, you know, are really setting that expectation for um, working on those executive functioning skills. So kind of working through a routine, working through a schedule. Um, I know for us here at Julie Billiard, we, you know, send homework home, not as kind of busy work, but as executive functioning skills to kind of work on those things. It's not a ton of time. Um, so, you know, when we kind of send those things home, it is for them to kind of work through. So, um, you know, when we see that it's like, well, they, they couldn't do it. Um, we want to kind of like take a step back and kind of look at what supports we could build in to be able to push them um, to kind of work on that skill, because that is definitely a skill like lifelong kind of working through tasks and kind of what needs to be done. Um, so whether that's building in some visual supports, um, you know, kind of maybe creating a reward system, um, you know, kind of looking at what um, reinforcement to kind of build in for that kind of motivation um, breaks, all of those things. Um, but it's definitely an area that we, um, you know, don't want to kind of just brush by and say, oh, it's just their disability. Um, because we know that's a skill they're going to need later in life. So we have to kind of continue to target that and work on that. <clears throat> Um, so as I had mentioned, you know, at what point does it, you know, kind of become a problem? Um, you know, when are those behaviors kind of really challenging and really affect kind of the academic environment? Um, and like one criteria that, you know, we really look at is when the behavior is significant enough that it inf interferes with um, the student's learning, um, their social relationships, or um, a peer's ability to kind of learn. Um, you know, if it's a kind of really distracting behavior, um, it's kind of, you know, setting everyone off or, you know, distracting everyone that they can't focus. Um, that would be a time where we'd really want to um, kind of dig in a little bit deeper and, you know, start kind of collecting some of that ABC data, um, potentially start working on an FBA um, if we don't know what the function of the behavior is. Um, and then, you know, kind of creating a BIP if that's needed a behavior intervention plan um, to address those behaviors. Um, you know, working with the team, you know, the teachers, um, you know, we can really kind of get those observations, kind of collect that data and see, um, you know, again, what reinforcement system we could put in place, how we can kind of decrease those behaviors and see how it relates to their, their disability. Um, you know, if it's a student that is, um, you know, like not raising their hand, they're just kind of shouting out, um, continually just shouting out, kind of blurting out. Um, and it's obviously stopping the teacher from being able to teach. It's, you know, preventing students from learning. Um, we would want to really kind of jump in and start like addressing that, um, you know, knowing that impulsivity might be a um, characteristic or a symptom of their um, disability, but, you know, kind of also knowing that we just can't let it go. Like that's um, not kind of an option. So 
um, recognizing that it may be an area that they need to work on, but also recognizing that we can work on that skill. We can build on, um, you know, those positive behaviors of being able to raise a hand, sitting quietly, staying in your seat um, for a lot of those. As I had mentioned, I think um, executive functioning is kind of one of the one of the biggest areas. Um, you know, with time management, transitions, organization. Um, you know, a lot of our students kind of really struggle in that area. Um, transitions, you know, specifically making sure they have all of their materials. Um, you know, there's like folders, books, notebook, homework, you know, worksheets, reading book, all the things that they you know really have to remember. Um, and we know that, you know, executive functioning is a big part of th their disability. Um, but again, we have to work on those skills um, and we can work on those and not just kind of write it off as, well, like they'll never be able to do that um, because we know we're able to teach executive functioning with, you know, repeated exposure, um, working on it both at school and at home. Uh, that's an area that we can really um start working to build up. And the earlier we can start that, the better. Um, you know, even our, our kindergartners go home with homework. It's like five minutes of work, but it's just to get in that routine of kind of getting the work done, sitting down, focusing, making sure you have everything you need um, and kind of doing that. Um, so, uh, you know, I think sometimes we hear from parents like, oh, like, they didn't change their gym clothes. They were in their bag. Did you check it for them? And, you know, well, you know, they have autism. They're not going to remember to do that. That They're at, they're there to work on that skill. Um, and it's so like, yes, they are, but, you know, we're still, you know, holding them to that expectation that we have to, you know, work on remembering that. Yes, we'll give reminders, um, you know, and we can, again, create visuals and supports to kind of assist with that. Um, but, building in that like responsibility to work on those skills um, is, is very important to um, their, their skills long-term. Um, so being able to recognize that it's, you know, not just this moment, but, you know, we're preparing them for high school, after high school, whatever that may look like, um, where these skills will all be super important. Some of the um, examples that we kind of see across our, our grade bands um, that are, you know, pretty typical, you know, on, on the service level for the development or kind of age that the, the students are. Um, so, you know, like for our, our K to two bands, um, you know, explaining instructions or expectations, that's something we have to kind of do a lot because we're building those foundational skills. So, you know, outside of their disability, just kind of their age is a skill that they don't necessarily have yet. So that's something that we continue to work on um, to, you know, be able to support them again, kind of create those foundational skills for, um, you know, the future, the future grades, um, for them, again, introducing a lot of those kind of reinforcement um, areas like the class-wide reinforcement systems is a, um, you know, kind of typical thing that we start kind of doing in the key to two. Um, so a lot of those are, you know, kind of typical things and we move into um, the three, four grade band. And again, that's where we kind of see a lot of those executive functioning skills um, or lack thereof. Um, kind of start to come out a little bit. Um, you know, we start doing a little bit more um, transitioning with classes. So having more material to kind of be responsible for, um, you know, writing their homework in, all of those things. Um, so that's an area that we really see um, that kind of start to be difficult for the students kind of across the board, um, outside of their disability, just a typical third and fourth grade student. Um, then you kind of add in the disability and it kind of just adds a whole nother layer, um, which just means we have to work a little bit harder to work on those skills. Um, moving into kind of like the fifth, sixth grade band, 
um, we kind of start to see those those attitudes, that disrespect, um, kind of talking back. I'm sure the parents, you guys see it at home too. It's not just at school. Um, but, you know, again, that's pretty typical in development when they're, you know, again, trying to um, look for that independence, figure out what they can do on their own. What are the boundaries? How far can we push? Um, you know, is somebody still going to be around if I mess up? Like if I make a mistake, like, you know, will I get help? Um, so those are a lot of things we kind of see in that, that fifth, six um, level. And again, with um, the hormones and kind of everything going on developmentally, um, it's a lot to kind of add in again with, um, with the disability. So um, it's, it's workable, it's doable, but it's that kind of repeated exposure and targeted intervention for um, all of those. And then as we kind of move up to the seventh, eighth level, um, kind of looking at more of those peer relationships, um, you know, figuring out who is a friend, what is a friend, um, humor and language. Like we heard a joke on the bus and so we're going to try to tell it to a friend and it's like, they don't really get it. Right. Um, so kind of working through a lot of, a lot of those, um, you know, what we kind of hear outside and kind of how that applies to our peers here at school, um, and what that kind of looks like. So we see a lot more of, um, you know, friendships like best friend today, enemy tomorrow. Um, and it's kind of them navigating what a friend is, kind of learning all of those things. So, um, you know, with a targeted like social skills and things like that is um, super important. Um, definitely at that age, clearly earlier as well. Um, but as they kind of start to develop and work through those relationships, um, you know, kind of building in that extra support. Then the the last thing that I kind of wanted to talk about in terms of, um, you know, behavior versus disability kind of in the classroom or the school setting um, is what we kind of notice or what you see. Um, so um, like excessive breaks, um, this time out of the classroom, taking laps, kind of needing those breaks, movement breaks, um, side conversations, snide remarks, um, cheating, you know, kind of start seeing the lying to, which, um, you know, isn't great, but for, you know, our students with disabilities, it's, you know, cheating and lying are typical behaviors, like developmentally. So, you know, when we kind of see those it's kind of a tiny celebration of like, okay, like we are kind of grasping those those concepts. We kind of are picking up on a lot of those things. Um, so, you know, it's just the level that it kind of occurs at. If it's continuous um, and it interferes with kind of the day-to-day -day interactions and it's definitely something, you know, we want to target for intervention. Um, but looking at um, kind of the real cost of, what that looks like for the student, right? So, um, you know, they need movement breaks. They have to get up and move. That's okay. But that's time out of the classroom, which then, you know, getting up and leaving is distracting the other students or teachers. Um, it reduces the amount of participation and kind of academic time um, in the classroom and learning. Um, and it's, you know, lowering that motivation, right, for being in class. Um, so, you know, while we understand that, you know, some students need, um, you know, more movement, things can be individualized, um, for each student. Um, but we kind of have to also recognize that, you know, yes, they might need movement, but could they hold off for five or 10 more minutes to get through this lesson? Um, most of the time the answer is yes. Um, so kind of looking at that as like, yes, that's part of who they are. They they need more frequent breaks, um, but also kind of like the cost of um, academics with that. So, you know, building in a lot of like movement breaks. I know they do for classes across the grade bands here. Um, so, uh, you know, again, just kind of recognizing that it might be 
part of their disability that they they have movement, kind of constant movement. Um, but we still have to hold them to the expectation that they can learn, they will learn, um, and we can put supports in place for them to learn. Um, but we still have to hold them to that um, that expectation in the classroom. You just want me to start talking? <laughs> or am I supposed to do a transition here, Kayla? Just start talking, Jay. <laughs> All right. So thank you. That that was really good. That was interesting. I think the things you picked were pretty fascinating. So let me let me start this off by saying here's my thoughts. When when we came up with this topic, I was thinking about typical or not, and then it depends on whose eyes you're looking through, which I think is something as a parent to consider. Because, you know, if it's a trained teacher's eyes, if it's a BCBA, if it's a peer, if it's a peer's parent, I think people look at things differently depending on who's looking, when you're looking, when behaviors occur and that. And I'm going to start with a story. I met with a kid today. He's a great kid, and he's like, 12, almost 13 years old. And he moved to Cleveland when he was a couple of years ago, started school. He's ADHD, great kid, really bright, but annoying as all get out. And, um, you know, now that he's older, he's had a hard time shaking that reputation and he's sort of paying for it. And we're working hard on it. And the reason I'm bringing this up is, you know, I think that we as adults go, well, so-and-so's got ADHD. But, you know, kids start going like that dude's annoying and they're only going to give it so much time and effort or move on from that kid. So I think when you're thinking, when should I intervene as a parent? Let me give this overlay. The overlay is that as they get older, honestly, nobody really cares what it is in some of the outside settings. They just want your kid to behave or they're not going to invite them back over your house or they don't want their kid with you. Um, if it's a school, they're going to be more involved in interventions, maybe an IEP, a 504 plan, et cetera, et cetera. And if it's a therapist, certainly they're going to look at it from different eyes. So I think that the, I would say overall, first thing to say about that part would be the earlier you intervene, the better. And I asked parents to think about if they did the behavior at home that they if they took it to the community, how would it be seen? Um, now, there is a caveat, and it's not a nice thing to say, but it's actually true, which is if your child looks like they have a disability, I think people are more patient with some of these behaviors than if the child looks like doesn't look like they have a disability. So I, there is that caveat that I think we should put in there. So when do I intervene? The answer is the earlier, the better, but the point being, too, that it takes a team to intervene. So the older your kid gets, and I think this is what Tyler was sort of talking about, the normal transition of things. Actually, if you're a parent and you think about this, the less you see your kid with other kids, the more they're involved with other kids. You don't have play dates as much. Things are happening. And so you have to get the school involved. And with a plan, if that's helpful, and sometimes some schools are easier to involve than others. Um, if you have parents that are going to involve, maybe the kids over their house, you're over their house, back and forth, parents, et cetera, can be helpful to each other. So the earlier, the better, and looking at those behaviors. So if you can flick me to the next slide, that would be great. Okay, so some of this Tyler already covered, but let me talk about this. So I think what is the problem? So when you start with temper tantrums, all kids have temper tantrums. And at what age do they have temper tantrums? Well, younger ages, they have temper tantrums. So uh, I'll put Lanny on the spot for a second because Lanny's got all these kids that she has fun with, right? Lanny, what age would you say that kids grow out of temper, temper tantrums? Well, I haven't found it yet. Um yeah. Because my six-year-old still will, if she's overexhausted or overstimulated, she will have meltdowns. Yeah. So I think that's good. I think six, maybe seven, 
then they start to go out of them because they start being aware that they really don't want to do that as much and they start to use their words and Lanny I like what you said you know are they exhausted are they hungry did their meds wear off there's all those things that go in and Tyler was talking a little bit about this but I'd like to say like for example if your kid's on medication and it's wearing off or they stayed up late and there was a holiday or something like that it's going to affect that differently so we're working on the cure for the temper tantrum is that kids can use their words. I'm upset because. And so that's what I want to talk about in my presentation is a little bit more about what's the problem behavior and what's the missing skill and how do we get the missing skill in place, if that makes sense. So parallel play. Okay, let's take parallel play. And I'll go with Tyler for a minute because Tyler, you've got three kids. And you got all those kids at school that you work with. What age do kids grow out of parallel play and get into interactive play? Now, for people at home, that means that if there's two kids sitting in a room, both put, doing puzzles in the room, but not really interacting, that's different than they were doing a puzzle together. Tyler, what age would you think that they start that interactive play? Well, my two and three-year-old are doing that interactive play. Yeah. So yeah so early on would you agree with me tyler yes yeah so you should be seeing that at about age three for sure to some degree and if you're not seeing that then we need to be working on that skill now if you work with kids on the spectrum if you have kids that are on the spectrum what you'll see is they often don't do interactive play because they'd rather do what they want to do when they want to do it and if you ask them, they'd say, well, why would I want to do what Tommy wants to do and share when I can do what I want to do and don't have to be bothered with other people? And the answer is because that's life. Um, so if you don't take that on, what I can share with you is there's parents that walk in with 17 year olds that have never learned that skill. And the problem is that they can't emerge into typical environments in a workplace or other things like that. And we have a program at our office that works on this that I see with my older kids. And they have problems at school, they have problems in work settings, et cetera, because they never learned that initial interactive skill. Okay, um, at home and exploring the world. So is Mary Jo on? Because I can't see Mary Jo. Mary Jo, can you help me out? What age do kids start exploring the world, start leaving their house and going, I want to go to Tommy's house and play or something? What do you think? Um, I would say that's a two-sided question. It really depends the comfort level of the family and where they live, right? Mm -hmm. But where my kids went to school, um, they would walk home third, fourth, fifth grade because they were with a group of kids. They would all get some ice cream at Ben and Jerry's and then I would hope they made it around the circle. Like it was just kind of, did you make it around Fairmont Circle? Hopefully they're around the Fairmont Circle and they made so it around. So it yeah. really depends, but I think it becomes a peer group. Um, like your peer group is doing it seventh, eighth grade. You know, you're walking home from school together. Really, but I think where you live and the family's comfort level would probably play a role into that. I think that would affect certainly in their safety issues, things like yeah. that. I appreciate that. So I'm going to say um, at home versus exploring the world, that fourth, fifth, sixth grade kids start exploring the world a little bit more. Now, the world changed because of the pandemic and the world changed because of video games. And I could talk a ton about video games and video game addiction. But the point being that right now, kids don't have to leave their bedroom to socialize. So they can get on a game and they can socialize with their friends. But there is a value in being able to go to another kid's house and eat dinner at somebody else's house. Maybe they have different rules, things like that. That's an important skill for them to learn. If you're not seeing that, I think part of it sometimes is the parents need to make the connections because when the kids are younger, the parent and parent can make the plans. And as the kid gets older, the kids have to make the plans and the parents have to sort of certify the plan. So I think that's important. Now, this next one's a really super important one, which is what age do kids go from acquaintances to having true friends? And I, I hope you're all thinking about this at home for a second. Now, a lot of kids have acquaintances. There's kids they know 
And when kids are younger, you invite the whole class to the birthday party and stuff. But I think by fifth, sixth, seventh grade, kids start developing their friend group. And their friend group includes not 50 kids usually, but three or four that are their best friends. And if we're not seeing those skills develop, then we might want to look at what's getting in the way. And the example, again, would be on the spectrum, maybe they're missing the social skills. They don't know how to get their friends. Okay, if they're ADHD, I have kids that do annoying things because they think they're going to make friends being annoying. Um, uh, Tyler talked about the jokes. A lot of times kids retell a joke too many times or don't understand the joke. So again, I think the, the skill being what skills missing and if it's something getting in their way for example adhd autism whatever we need to look at that and work on that barrier but it's still overcoming that obstacle because there's a transition they should go from acquaintances to friends to better friends to relationships etc now um next one's sort of a fun one what age do kids go from a play date to a hangout what age does play date go out that's always a fun thing. So I got parents going, well, we're going to invite someone over for a play date and the kid's in eighth grade. I'm like, uh, I don't think you should call it a play date because uh, they're going to go run in the other way. Uh, so kids using language that's appropriate. And I think this is a really good one to consider. If you're a parent also are using the words that are appropriate for them to be using too, because they don't want to be saying those things. And some kids are very aware of words they use, clothes they wear, how they dress, et cetera. And some kids, for example, uh, again, a lot of the kids I work with with autism are less involved with what they wear. They could wear the same clothes through the whole week. Um, showers are not something that they do very often. They're allergic to them. Um, and so parents have to develop those habits early on that the kids are developing that skill that makes it routine. So hygiene, um, this is kind of an interesting question too. What age do kids go from mom and dad are telling you get in the bath or shower to the age where the kid is heading to the shower themselves? Um, hmm. Tyler, what do you think? You work with all age kids. Yeah. Uh... It's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Your Say, kids are little. Yeah, they're still little. Um, uh, upper middle school, maybe? Yeah. Uh, and I think here's a really sexist comment. So I think I'm being recorded, but I should be careful about this. Girls get this before boys do. I think girls are much more aware of their appearance in general from what I see because other girls will say something to them. Uh, boys are a little behind on that. Girls actually develop physically first, so girls are a little bit more aware of the hygiene than the boys are. Um, but self-driven often is when they are aware of their peer group, there's somebody they're interested in dating-wise or something like that. And again, if they're missing that skill, I think we should go back and fish out why. So do they not understand it? Do they forget it? Do they get up too late in the morning to do the skills they need? Do they need a checklist because they have executive function issues? And that's really bridging on what Tyler was talking about from a school setting to a setting outside of school because it's the same skills that they need to develop. Homework. This is really cool because Tyler was talking about homework. So homework, when does it go from, and I'm going to ask Mary Jo on this one. Mary Jo, when do kids go from homework is your mom's responsibility to make sure you're doing it to where they're actually autopilot and the parents are just there for questions? So I think now keep in mind, I'm not looking at someone with a specific learning disability, like a learning right. disability, right? So this is your, a traditional kid with maybe some executive functioning, okay? Um, right. I would say you would be fading away in eighth grade and the seventh grade trying yeah. to fade out. And then when they're hitting high school, that's when that independence should come in. Um, I find that schools are do such a better job with keeping everything online, Google Docs. The teachers are much more comprehensive. 
So that executive functioning skill I find decreases because everything is there. You don't have to bring the book bag home. You just have to bring the computer because it's all right there. So yep. that is helpful for our ADHD kids when they get into high school. Um, so I'd say fade away, eighth grade. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Seventh, eighth, and we want to get them ready for high school. Yeah. And I like what you said, too, and I want to make a comment about it because we're talking about disabilities or challenges. So kids with learning disabilities, kids with comprehension issues. I want to talk about kids with auditory processing issues, things like that, too, that what we want to do is we want to work with them on self-advocacy. So somewhere between, you know, where your mom's doing your homework with you to you're doing it yourself they have to be able to advocate for themselves go to a teacher and say i understand number one and three but i don't understand number two they need to understand i should start my hard work at school and the stuff i understand i'm going to work on at home so we want to work on those skills because i think that it's even more important if you have a learning disability because you have some barriers that are there so you have to learn the tricks of the trade earlier not that you can't learn them you have to learn them earlier. Um, and I think the other thing I would say about this one is technology is great. Mary Jo knows a ton about it. But, you know, even the idea of you can just trigger the computer to read you out loud anything that you have on the computer is amazing for kids with processing issues because that really helps them out a lot. Okay, schoolwork and executive function. So Tyler was talking about this a little bit, but just... I think what age do kids start taking on executive function? I think you should start young. You know, lists are really great. I, You know, with kids on the spectrum, usually you'll see that they have pictures or some type of board that's there. And you can start with household chores or their morning routines or things like that. Because I think developing executive function skills is a process. Again, if your child has more problems related to executive function, for example, they go upstairs and they see the cat and they're distracted by the cat because their meds haven't kicked in yet. Um, that's a really good example of that. And they have to learn that they have to keep their eyes on the prize, which is what I talk about in therapy, eyes forward to get to the bathroom because the cat's going to distract them. They're going to be gone. And so, again, my driving force is um, that's a typical progression, but we have to take into account what's getting in their way and how do we solve that problem. Okay, can you skip me to the next slide, please? And thank you. Okay, so consider the behavior and when they occur. So talk about the topic versus their topic versus other topics. So here's a couple ones I just wanted to highlight. So in particular, I want to highlight um, kids on the spectrum big problem I see socially that you really want to work on early is that they will harp on their topic. So whatever their high interest area is, if they're interested in World War II, you will know everything about World War II. And they don't understand that everybody else doesn't really care about everything about World War II. And if you entertain that at home, which a lot of parents do, the kid sort of sees that as typical and what you want to do is be working towards, no, we're listening to two sentences about World War II. Now you need to ask me about something in my life. So again, from the home to transitioning it is really important because typical kids will ask about the other topics, but some of these other kids with some of these challenges may not. Talks with meaning to parents and friends. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So they start to be aware that other people have feelings, other people have things they're thinking about. And I think that that's the deeper social skill than we were talking about earlier. And that's a really important skill that kids develop by high school, that they understand that how other people think and feel. Um, and that third line is related to it. It's called theory of mind. And I'd like to just share with this, how do I see it? How do you see it? And then how do I change my behavior based on the way you see it? So I see it that, you know, I want to talk about what I want to talk about. How do you see it? That's sort of boring. So I'm going to talk about what you want to talk about sometimes because I want friends. Now, these are just some examples of behaviors that should be shifting, but with certain challenges, they get interrupted. And I'm going to use the word interrupted because I think in therapy, 
or with parenting skills or with good skills intervened from the school, you can jumpstart these, the motion of these skill development. Um, the key is the longer you wait to jumpstart it, the harder it is to get going. Okay, what they want and, uh, and acting with remorse. So um, what I'm saying with that is, what I, why did I put what they want? What was that they want? Okay, but what I was talking about is kids developing the skill of they go for what they want, so they'll steal, and Tyler was talking about this a little bit, lie, and getting to the point where they get remorse. And this is an important part because if your child's not developing remorse, that's a really important skill to develop. And again, what's getting in the way of it? Are they ADHD and too impulsive and they don't stop and think? Uh, are they unable to understand how somebody else feels? Okay, uh, what's missing that they're not developing that skill? And that's super important. Okay, can you flip me to my next slide, please? Okay, so these are really important. And I hope parents are listening and really think about what I'm gonna say next, because this is like the key to my practice. And I just want to talk about a couple of things we do at the practice. I'm going to talk about this. We have social skills groups. We have a, uh, a camp in the summer, overnight camp that does social skills and electronic reduction. We do individual therapy and we see a lot of these things. And that's why I'm bringing this up. We did a lot of creative things with programming. And the reason I'm saying this is because it relates to what these three things are going to be next. Okay, so when you're a parent, I think you need to measure your child versus typical peers. So for a lot of kids with challenges, be it a learning disability, ADHD, autism, they're starting off behind typical peers. Okay, now um, them versus similar peers. So for example, if you take them and they have ADHD and you measure them against other kids with ADHD, are they holding their weight? Now, let me take these two together for a second, because if you measure them against typical peers, let's say they're ADHD kids two to three years behind, are you closing that gap over time? Because you want to close that gap as they get older or else they graduate and they're two years or three years behind still, you're stuck with what do you do with them? With similar peers, in other words, an environment like Julie Billiard, the measurement's different because the typical peers are different. The situation changes, though, because when they leave that protected environment, then the rules change. And I think that's important to think about. Now, the biggest one is them versus themselves. Okay, so are they growing against themselves? Now, if they are not growing and changing, like they're really stuck and not moving forward, that is key because they're not gonna close the gap. And if they're not moving forward, and if you don't understand this, you can ask me questions in the chat, but they're actually falling behind. So please think about that because not moving forward is falling behind because everybody else is moving forward, be it with learning, executive function, social skills, temper tantrums, all the things Tyler mentioned too. So that is key. Now that may mean there's meds need adjusted. That may mean they need a therapist. That may mean they need their 504 plan or IEP updated. That could be a zillion things to think about but we wanna be looking at all those variables that could be. Uh, could you flick the slide? And I think there's one more slide. Nope, that was it. So let me sum it up for a sec. So the most important thing I think to consider is, um, is it typical, is it not typical? Is it due to the disability? Okay, if it is, the important thing is what are we doing about it? Earlier intervention is important. Okay, closing the gap keeping the eye on who's measuring it. Remember, peers are measuring from a different yardstick than schools, than therapists, than parents, okay? And so I think that's important to consider in terms of what we're doing to intervene with kids in all these areas. I'm gonna stop talking and leave it up to you guys.
Okay, so we did have one question. Um, the first question is, my grandson, who is moderately autistic, is intentionally breaking things in our home and doesn't seem to have any accountability. Any suggestions how to deter or change the behavior? Well, do you want me to answer that? I think, yeah, Jay, go ahead. Okay, so I think the the first question comes up, which is, you know, what's the situation, you know, when kids are breaking stuff, and Tyler was talking about a functional behavior assessment, you can actually sort of take that out of a school setting too. What's the function of that behavior? So is breaking stuff because he's angry and he's just taking out on things? Is it because there's a tension? You know, and when you say there's no accountability, I would be curious to say, what does that mean? Do you have consequences for him? Is he punished? Does he lose things? Does he have to replace it? You know, what is he getting out of that behavior? So sometimes it's important to consider stop and think and go, what, what is the person getting out of this behavior? And as a therapist, I can tell you all behavior has a purpose. Okay. It's the, the, the question is, what is the purpose of that behavior? And is it working? Now, oftentimes there may not be, there may be one parent holding the kid accountable and another parent not. Okay, if a kid's living with their grandparents, I have situations where the kid's angry because they're getting older and they're like, why am I with my grandparents? Why am I not with my parents? Okay, and they have questions and it's not able to verbalize it, so it's coming out in behavior. And so I could answer 50 possibilities for that, but the question is, what's the function of that behavior? And uh, that's what a FBA basically is in a school setting. Can I can I add something? Yep. Uh, Tyler and Jay really, I think, were very clear on. I like how Tyler, you talked about the different ages and what is appropriate, like the, you know, um, peer group. So, and Jay, you kept talking about how early intervention, early intervention. But I want to bring that together because there's a lot of families that could be on our call right now and have older seventh, eighth graders, and that early intervention is gone, right? Because they're so much older. So I guess my takeaway from that is I want the families to understand that just because they're older, you understand what that behavior is, you target that behavior, you talk with your team, and you still build skills. You still put in skills and you have those skills identified in your IEP or your 504 on how you're helping um, your seventh and eighth grader. So I guess I just want to make sure that everyone understands that, yes, you're spot on. The younger they are, it is going to, there's less problems, right? There's less things to deal with. And as they get older, you can still target those concerns. It's a little, di it's more difficult because there's so many other things occurring, but it's, you're still able to, to navigate that executive functioning deficit if you pepper in those skills that they need to survive in their academic world and their social um, where And where I would add to that, I think that's a good point, Mary Jo, and maybe I didn't make this clear enough because it could be my fault, but you know, early intervention is a relative thing. So sixth or seventh grade may still be early intervention. Great point. Okay, because it's earlier than high school, right? Because you're getting it under control. And what I say is, you know, often if a kid's like, for example, breaking things, okay, in sixth grade, well, you know, that's easier to deal with than they're now bigger than you and they're in 11th grade and they're 200 pounds and now they're really out of control. So I think in early intervention is a relatively, you know, relative comment um, that's there. And I like what you're saying about bringing it in with the school but I'd also say, you know, bringing it in with the family, and that includes grandparents, that includes siblings, by the way, because siblings could be perpetuating the behavior too by their reaction to their brother or sister. Now, a lot of times, just from, as a therapist, I can tell you, um, there's many times where I'm working with a child who has some kind of challenge, ADHD, autism, whatever, and I will do a session or two with the siblings to make sure that they're not inadvertently fueling the behavior that the parents are trying to extinguish. So Jay, for the um, person that had asked the question, would, if the grandson is, is breaking things, would there be something you would do differently if it was a younger student, like your first um, step or 
like, would you do something differently if they were older? So like, what would be something that they could start to work on with that child so that they might not, so they can kind of replace that instead of breaking behaviors, they do use those words. So like, if it was a younger kid, I know at JB, like one, we would make them clean up whatever they broke. And then we Mm -hmm. would say like, you know, you can say I'm frustrated and I want, you know, we would try to give them the language. Use their words. Yep. Yeah. So do you do the same thing regardless of what age the child is at? Well, uh, I think that's a great question, Jody. And let me kind of comment on that if that's okay, which is, you know, I think it's what age they're chronologically at and then what age they're emotionally at. So, you know, they could be 15 and not able to use their words yet, and they could be six and able to use their words. So like you said, cleaning it up, great. I think that's a natural consequence. But what's the solution? The solution is if you don't want to break and stuff, they need to be able to use their words. And a couple of tips from Heloise in terms of a therapist, interesting things to look for. Number one is, are they breaking their own stuff or somebody else's? That's always pretty interesting. Because they're really out of control if they're breaking their own stuff. That's the kids that are usually totally out of control. The kids that are under control don't break their stuff. They break other people's stuff. So it's just a little tip to kind of think about. Um, And the other part is punishing or reinforce or consequences can go both ways. So I'd also work on if they use their words, what's the reinforcement for that? So what's the positive thing that comes your way? Because, you know, kids will tell me there there were times I felt like breaking something, but I didn't. But nobody pays attention to that. They only pay attention to the time I did break something. So I think it's important to, to look at the backside of that, too. Good point. Tyler, do you have... Sorry, Tyler, do you have something that you wanted to add there? Because I saw you kind of unmuted. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, you know, agreeing with all of that and really, you know, kind of the response comes t- down to kind of what the function is, right? So like based on what the function is, because if it's, um, you know, if it's because they want their their iPad or they want to watch a specific show, you know, not giving them attention, kind of ignoring them is not going to kind of be the fix for that scenario versus, you know, if they want your attention and you're kind of yelling at them, right, you're giving them the attention. So it's kind of maintaining that behavior. Um, that would kind of be a good opportunity to kind of step back and say, okay, that's kind of why they're doing it. They're doing it for attention. And then kind of building in, like Dr. Burke said, like that language, like being able to request, you know, time to talk or time together or kind of whatever that may be. Um, But, you know, one thing I see is like, sometimes if we don't understand the functions of behavior um, that we could potentially be reinforcing it, not reinforcing that behavior, not knowing um, that we kind of are doing that. So. Let me hop on board with another interesting thing, Tyler. I like working with you. You're fun. Um, Hey, uh, Sometimes parents also don't understand the function of behavior because you didn't grow up with it. So here's an example, like with video games, a lot of parents don't understand that the kid breaks stuff. I've had kids throw monitors and break things and break up the house. And there are games, for example, Clash of Clans. I don't know if anybody's heard of it or not, but basically you're in a clan. And if you drop out of the middle of a game, your team is punished for you dropping out. So if the parent's making a request and then they shut off the computer on the kid that's getting a dopamine drip off the game and their friends are on there and then their friends are punished and going to be angry at them the next day at school, you may not even be aware of that. And that's just a like a an example of like a hidden meaning that may be there that you may not be aware of. So sometimes they're obvious, sometimes they're hidden. Okay. We have um, one that kind of is a, also, I think, kind of a hidden curriculum type of thing. So the question is, I have a child that has an FBA and a BIP, Behavior Improvement Plan. He has had interventions since he was two. He is great and thriving. He has severe dyslexia, nonverbal learning disability, and expressive and receptive language delays. He presents as a totally typical peer. We are very open and chatty about our child not being neurotypical, 
We have very intolerant neighbors. If the adults stayed out of it all, it would be good. As a lot of the behavior is typical for my son and his peers, but the parents always get involved. It makes life miserable on our street. Any tips talking to the other parents that ship has sailed? So Jay, do you wanna try that one? Well, yeah, um, I, I can tell you a brief story related to it. I have a kid that I see who actually they had to move because the neighbors made it so miserable for the kid that the environment got so rugged, it was really difficult. I mean, I, I think that um, if there's a group of parents, which I'm understanding can be part of the problem, you sort of got to pick them off one at a time and gain their confidence and understanding because the group has a group think that doesn't always go really well. Um, and sometimes it's the neighborhood's not going to be the place for your kid and they got to invite kids from their school or their peers that they're going to swing with a little bit better. Um, and you're right, parents get involved and then you got to think about as <laughs> it's sort of like, what's the function of the parents' behavior? Like, why are the parents acting that way? Um, is it that they would want their kid to be a certain type of kid themselves? They don't want them to be friends with that kid, whatever. And it depends on, I'm curious, as maybe that person can say how old this kid is now. Does it say how old the kid is? Is the kid a little kid or middle school or high school or what? Um, he's 11. Can I add okay. to that? Jay, also, I think we also need to find out um, our little 11 year old. Is it affecting that? Is it affecting him? Is it just the the background music? Is the parents getting involved, and is it not affecting the kids? I don't know that answer, but you want to keep in mind that just because the parents are talking doesn't mean the students understand what's that that feeling is there. As Jay just said, it could be the adults' own issue has nothing to do with the kids. So I think there's a lot of layers um, and a lot of unknowns in that narrative okay yeah, so and did... i agree with that i would also add try to make your house the kool-aid house as i call it you know so if your house is the kool-aid house where stuff's happening and kids are making stuff kids are having fun you have it on your turf you have the ability to win people over a little bit more and so you know be a really involved parent can help that situation because you can steer it yeah great point um so they, a couple follow-ups for that is they did say that it was stressful because the neighbor had called the cops on the child last Sunday and that the kids have been groomed to tattle constantly um, and they've tried to be the Kool-Aid house um, and they have for years, um, but it hasn't worked. I think I'd move on. I, I just don't think that's fair to your the family. And there's so many other uh, activities you can do in the community. Um, yeah, I would tr try to find your niche. Yeah. You know, I, I, I kind of say it this way, like as kids get older, like in high school, like if you're looking for, this is like an interesting comment, but if you're looking for relatively nice groups of accepting kids, hit the marching band, hit the theater group. Um, you know, a lot of kids that are not athletic can be on a team by doing an individual sport within a team. They can be a runner. They can do things like that. So I would try to look for things in the community where the kid's going to fit and find a more accepting crowd of people. Um, the other thing is, as those kids get older, 12, 13, 14, they may say to their parents, hey, no, I like so-and-so, and they may push back on their parents. But at 11, you know, if their parents are grooming them to tattletale, that's kind of going to be hard, hard to beat. That's unfair. That's There's a lot going on there. Yeah. Okay, another question is, um, how can I scale back the support I'm giving when it comes to homework um, or like asking them to kind of handle the hygiene issues? So like if they're reliant on the parents' support and they rely too much on the parents' support, how do you start backing off on that? Uh, you want me to answer, Tyler, sure. you want to answer? Yeah, go ahead. Whichever. Okay. Go for it, Jay. Okay. Okay. So, um, again, I think it's meeting the kid where they're at to start with. That's really important. And thinking, number one, are they capable of this at this time? So does this kid need a list in the shower, for example? 
you know, where they have the things listed and it's like step one, step two, step three, step four. Is it at that level that they need that? With homework, it's, you know, having them, for example, start what they can do on their own and then saying, now you work on it 20 minutes and then I'll come in after the 20 minutes on the things that you haven't done that you don't understand. So it's transitioning them towards that. Now, the caveat of that is, and I think this is important if it's a kid with super dyslexia or processing issues, and let's say the material is overwhelming to the kid on homework, that's a different story because that's where you need to get involved with the school to go, is this work appropriate for this child in what they're doing? Because that could be part of the issue. Um, so I think that those are all really important parts of it. You know, and even thinking about like showering, washing their hair, do they have the fine motor skills to do that? Maybe they don't have the fine motor skills and they actually need to work on those kind of things. Um, so it's that assessment would be there, but it would be a stepwise progression would be my answer to that. Tyler, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I don't think I agree with that kind of meeting them where they're at. Um, you know, another kind of part of that is, you know, you you can start to kind of fade yourself out and kind of see where the problems come up. Um, and, you know, and kind of, yeah, because you kind of don't really know until you do it. Right. So um, maybe it is like setting a timer, like, all right, you have the first 10 minutes and kind of just seeing how that goes. You're going to always add more. Um, maybe it's just a visual schedule for the shower or they're, you know, brushing their teeth routine. Um, so I think it's never a bad time to fade out. I would just be available and recognize like, all right, the homework might actually be hard tonight. They might not understand this concept. So like kind of being ready to jump in. Um, but I never think it's a bad idea to kind of start feeding out and kind of preparing that independence, um, for any of those skills. And I well, would let me jump on some on this for a fun thought. So at my summer camp, we do the parents arrive with the kid and oftentimes the parent wants to make the kids bet. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. They're doing summer camp for 10 days. Well, they don't know how to make their bed. Well, wait a minute. And we start with eight year olds and we go all the way up to 20 year olds. They don't know how to make a bed. What's a skill they could learn. You could watch another kid make their bed. You could ask a kid to show you how to make your bed. So there are skills that you could build off of that if they're missing those set of skills that they can still borrow from, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, how do they acquire the additional support that they need doesn't always have to come from the parent. And then if I could add to that, it doesn't have to be perfect. So if they're doing a worksheet and they put their name on the right-hand corner, it was supposed to be in the left-hand corner, their name is on the paper. So just because they didn't do it the way that the parent expected it, they did sit there for 15 minutes and they did complete the task. So I think sometimes we need to have those uh, little celebrations and uh, oh, those little um, happy moments when the child did complete a task, even though if it wasn't perfect, I think you need to still celebrate those victories. Okay, and then the last question as of right now is, are there recommendations for activities or programs to help my child make friends? So I know JB, we have our, beyond camp in the summer that works and focuses mostly on the social um, components and friendship. And then we do like direct social skills groups. Um, there's Lego groups. I think if you find something that your child is interested in, so they have like Lego groups, if that's an area of interest, um, you know, sometimes in your community rec center, there's different activities that you can do. And I think kind of helping to prep them for you know, these are questions that you can ask when you first get there and you see someone so that they're mm -hmm. ready with those questions and they have kind of like that less anxiety of what to do when they first arrive someplace. So also, I think in terms of social there. skills, let me add a piece on that. I think social skills are sort of a, a thing that has multifaceted to them. So it's not just learning the skills, I think that's important, it's actually using the skills and incorporating it into their life. 
because I think all of us as professionals and you as guys as parents, there's certain kids that you could ask them and they could rotely tell you every social skill that they're supposed to do. But then there's a reason they're not doing it because they're anxious about getting rejected or they have a processing issue and they can't keep up with the other kids and talk fast enough or they're depressed because they've been rejected before. So I think there's like tiers to this. One is social skills instruction. And as I said, you know, we have groups as well at the office and those are ongoing groups, but it's also looking at, is there anxiety too much for the kid to apply the social skill? Um, one of the big ones for my processing disorder kids is like by middle school, if you're at a lunch table, the conversation moves very fast. It's much different than talking to one kid and it bounces back and forth. So how do you get into a group at that level? And so I'd say you've got your basic instruction, then you've got what gets in the way, then you've got working on those issues. Maybe their medication needs adjusted. Maybe they need the right group to be successful with. Are you setting them up for success? Um, even examples of what the parents do at home. So some kids, for example, with autism, if the parents are doing a play date, you want to do a short play date, keep it to two hours. You don't want to make it like five hours because it's going to go south probably. So you want to keep it short and successful in terms of your strategy for that. Um, also, kids getting in active play. So, for example, going to Adrenaline Monkey, where kids can parallel play and interactive play at the same time. They can do something with a friend, they do something on their own. So setting them into a situation where they can use that social skill. And Julie Billiard, I know, does this. We do this in our school, too. And I think it's really important, and, and Mary Jo can talk about this in IEP format, but what we call push-in skills. So the push-in skills are the most important because when we've got kids on our playground, we talk about, you know, what to do if you get out, how to be a good, gracious loser, things like that. But when it's happening is the most important time to be teaching those social skills because that's when you can really get in there. And I think that that's important. And that could be also considering siblings because example is most kids, the, the person they spend the most time with is with their sibling. So what does their sibling do if they're not playing right? Okay, then the school, and then you go on from there. So if you're doing a camp, you want to make sure it's the right type of camp. So in other words, you don't want your kid being the highest functioning kid at that camp or lowest functioning kid in the camp. You probably want the kids smack dab somewhere in the posse um, because if they're going to gain from it, that's it. Now, a question I would tell parents, and I give you this tip to ask is, if you're looking for clubs and groups and things like that, I think there's a lot of things out there, but you want to ask what kids are appropriate for that group. And the second question, which is the more important question is what kids are not appropriate. So um, if they, you know, if they say, well, we don't take kids that are aggressive or we don't take kids that are blank, then you want to know that. So you're not setting them up for a failure. Um, and if I can add to that, there's a lot of camps out there, right? But maybe your, I'll say, sixth grader, um, it's not appropriate for him to go alone. Well, there's a lot of kids in high school that have to do service hours, right? So reach out to your local schools and maybe somebody would want to go to that camp and then they would be getting service hours. Always think outside the box. There's, there's individuals out there that want to help and there's young teachers that want to learn. So call John Carroll. See if there's an educator out there that needs service hours or needs um, experience. Those, those individuals are out there and they're looking for the services. So use them. The other thing is Jay talked about push in. And I want you to understand that that would be placed on section seven of your IEP. So if you have a child that has speech therapy and they get 20 minutes every two weeks and you're working on a specific skill, that's when you go to your meeting and you say, is there a way that we can do some push-in, maybe 10 minutes a week? Oh. That push-in would happen during your day, during your academic day in the general ed. It's kind of a broad statement and it would look really different for everybody, but I want everyone to know that that push-in instruction would be identified on section seven 
in your IEP. Yeah, Mary Jo said it. I guarantee it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I would have never known that in terms of the section. That was great. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I think it's really important that you fill out the survey that we send you after this. Um, you'll get something, I think, tomorrow, right, Kayla? Um, and the only way we can improve and the only way we know what topics that are really of interest to you where we can get some experts to speak on is if you respond. So please fill out the survey. Um, and then please, um, our next, our speaker series does continue. And our next one is actually on sex torsion. Um, this one, sadly, um, is really important to understand, especially if your child plays video games or is on um, social media quite a bit. Um, I think this one is really important to just recognize the safeguards and that our kids sometimes can be a target because of their desire to be um, accepted and to have friends and, and to kind of take things at face value. So sadly, that is an important one um, that we will be presenting on February 22nd. April 11th is ESY and transitions. And Mary Jo is going to talk a lot about that. And um, through kind of the, the support of the IEP and how you can advocate for, for ESY and what it looks like. Um, and then June 18th is financial preparedness. This is some of the resources outside of um, JB and, and what the community has to offer, um, what your county has to offer <clears throat> that can offset the cost of um, some summer program and some things that your, your child needs. Um, so <clears throat> with that, we are so grateful to Tyler and to Dr. Burke um, for presenting and for preparing this. Thank you for asking questions. Um, thank you for spending a portion of your evening with us. And we look forward to doing this again. So God bless. Be safe. Thank you. Bye, kids.